Time now to look at energy resources, both renewable and non-renewable. We start with a summary of the major sources of energy and how we generate power from them. Specific examples of energy resources, both from Arizona and elsewhere, are included throughout the presentation. This is the Colorado River's Glen Canyon Dam and the view north into southern Utah of Lake Powell. Energy resources can be fundamentally described as either renewable or non-renewable. Non-renewable resources, like fossil fuels and nuclear power, are those that have relatively limited availability and usage, meaning that they cannot be replaced quickly enough to keep up with consumption. Whereas renewable resources, like hydroelectric, geothermal, solar, and wind, are those with relatively unlimited availability and can be replenished over much shorter time frames. You can see that fossil fuels and nuclear power have provided roughly 90 to 95 percent of the energy usage in the United States for the second half of the 20th century. However, renewable resources are providing more energy in the 21st century and as of 2021 account for about 12 percent of U.S. energy use. Electricity in the United States is provided by these dominantly non-renewable resources, natural gas, coal, and nuclear power. This map showing the distribution of electrical generation across the U.S. has some interesting characteristics. The generation of electricity by natural gas is dominant in the east, especially along the coast. It is also important along the west coast. Coal is spread out more across the east, midwest, and mountain west. Oil-generated electricity is only significant in the northeast. Nuclear power has isolated locations across the country, and as for renewables, they are more regionally limited, with wind-generated electricity dominant in the Midwest, hydroelectricity significant for the Pacific Northwest down to California. Natural gas has recently expanded its role in electrical generation, but as with coal, it has become politically targeted. Nuclear power is important in the United States, providing about one-fifth of our electrical generation. By contrast, Japan, South Korea, and many European countries rely on nuclear power to a much greater extent for their electricity, with France topping the list at 78%. The fossil fuels include petroleum, natural gas, and coal. These resources are originally generated from the remains of carbon-based organisms, mostly microscopic plankton and algae. As long as the biomass does not decay, the organic matter contains energy that can survive burial and transformation into the various fossil fuel types. Think about it. The energy that you're using to view this lecture or drive your car could have originally come from sunshine that helped grow Paleozoic plants. And that's over 300 million years ago. You could be driving on Paleozoic sunshine. Okay, well, one other aspect that receives very little attention is that oil and natural gas may also have an abiotic origin, that is, produced via inorganic processes within the Earth. Earth's interior is rich in carbon, water, and other components necessary to produce hydrocarbons of various types, and it would only take the right environment for these processes to occur. Let's first look at the fossil fuel coal. In the formation of coal, organic matter must accumulate in oxygen-poor or anoxic conditions, like a swamp. Otherwise, it will decay and lose its value as an energy source. Burial causes temperature and pressure to increase, forcing out volatiles like oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, and concentrating the carbon. Different stages of this process produce different types of coal, and hydrocarbons too, like oil and natural gas. This distillation process takes a while, maybe thousands or even millions of years. Eventually, a relatively thin coal seam is the result. Coal is abundant and can be an important energy resource of the future. The United States, Russia, and China all have relatively substantial amounts of coal, and not only that, but several countries, including the U.S., have a large percentage of high-quality coal. Most of the coal in the U.S. is located in the Appalachian and Rocky Mountains, 
but also in the Midwest, including Illinois, Iowa, and North Dakota. The North Antelope Rochelle coal mine is located in the Great Plains of eastern Wyoming, where the Powder River Basin is the largest low sulfur coal source in the U.S. The North Antelope Rochelle mine is the largest coal mine in the world, with an estimated 1.4 billion tons of recoverable coal as of 2018. The North Antelope Rochelle mine and the nearby Black Thunder mine have been the top two producing coal mines in the U.S. The mine is operated by Peabody Coal, with around 1,200 employees working two shifts per day, seven days a week. Coal beds are in the Paleocene Fort Union Formation, which contains varying amounts of clastic sedimentary rocks, like sandstone, mudstone, and conglomerate with limestone and, of course, coal. There are several important coal seams in the Upper Fort Union Formation, but coal is mined exclusively from the Wyodak anderson Seam, which is 50 to 87 feet thick. The mine is located on the eastern flank of the Powder River Structural Basin, where bedding dips less than 3 degrees towards the west. This, combined with the relatively shallow and very thick coal seam, dictates that surface strip mining is the most efficient extraction method. Several huge drag lines are used mainly to remove the overburden from above the coal seam. And numerous large shovels assist in removal of the overburden, as well as load coal onto 250-ton to 400-ton haul trucks. Coal is then trucked to one of four hoppers where it is crushed and conveyed to silos before loading onto trains. This surface mining operation in 2022 produced 60.4 million tons of low sulfur subbituminous coal, thought to be the cleanest coal in the U.S. In 2021, coal from the North Antelope Rochelle mine was shipped to over 70 power plants in the U.S. And although there are many variables, the production life of this mine is estimated to reach around the year 2050. Coal deposits occur in Arizona, mostly on the Colorado Plateau, in places like Black Mesa, but also in East Central Arizona. These deposits are in Mesozoic rocks, specifically Cretaceous-aged rocks. However, with the closure of the Kayanta mine in 2019, coal is no longer mined in Arizona. Burning coal directly provides heat and was and still is used in furnaces and stoves around the world. Coal is also used to power steam engines. Burning coal heats the water, water boils and turns to steam, and the pressurized steam drives pistons that power the engine. It's interesting to note that the Titanic was the largest steamship in the world in 1912. Using a similar process, coal also powers larger steam electric power plants. Burning the coal heats water and creates steam that runs a turbine that powers a generator which makes the electricity. Emissions from such power plants has become highly regulated and has helped greatly reduce sulfurous emissions. These coal-fired power plants convert around 34% of the coal's energy into electricity. This method provides around 18% of U.S. electrical generation as of 2023. However, coal contains 0.2 to around 7% sulfur, so when burned, the sulfur combines with oxygen to form sulfur dioxide and then with water to make a dilute hydrochloric acid. So, for a long time, this was a major source of acid rain in certain industrial regions. Various environmental mitigation efforts, however, have greatly reduced this problem. Even so, the construction and operation of coal-fired power plants are currently mired in political controversy, for various reasons. Rightly or wrongly, coal provides almost one-fifth of U.S. electricity, and shutting down all coal power plants is simply not a realistic option, 
especially when there are no consistently reliable alternatives. As of 2017, five major coal-fired power plants produced around 29% of Arizona's electricity, including the 773-megawatt Coronado Generating Station near St. John's. Petroleum and natural gas are two other important fossil fuels. They are termed hydrocarbons, as they are compounds composed of hydrogen and carbon with varying amounts of oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. These deposits are thought to form from the burial, compaction, and distillation of organic material. The asterisk is a reference to the possible abiotic origin discussed previously. This material is heated, but not so much as to break down the hydrocarbon compounds. The resulting petroleum and natural gas then migrate from the source rock through fractures in the rock or some kind of permeable rock until they are ultimately trapped in some way to form a reservoir. If they are not trapped, they may reach the surface and form a seep. Once extracted, petroleum, or crude oil, is then refined into many different types, from gasoline and diesel to heating oil and asphalt. Natural gas is mostly methane, CH4, and is commonly present above the petroleum layer in a hydrocarbon reservoir. There are several types of hydrocarbon traps, and all include some kind of impermeable cap rock that prevents the upward or lateral migration of hydrocarbon fluids and gases. In such traps, hydrocarbons are located in some kind of permeable rock and are typically stratified by density, with water below the petroleum and natural gas on top. Structural traps include anaclines and structural domes, where the hydrocarbons pool along the axis of the fold. Salt domes form in response to rising low-density salt bodies. The impermeable salt intrusion deforms the strata around it so that hydrocarbons pool between the impermeable sedimentary layers and the impermeable salt intrusion. Faults are another type of structural trap where the fault offset juxtaposes impermeable units so that they can trap migrating fluids. Stratigraphic traps involve an impermeable layer trapping hydrocarbons due to angular unconformities, changes in sedimentary rock types like pinch outs or facies changes, sedimentary features like reefs, etc. There are a number of ways in which this can happen. Pump jacks are icons of oil fields all over the world. They mechanically extract oil in relatively small amounts, say one to 10 gallons per stroke. These units are also called walking beam pumps, horse head pumps, nodding donkey pumps, dinosaur pumps, big Texan pumps, thirsty bird pumps, the list goes on. The Prudhoe Bay oil field, located along Alaska's north slope, is one of the largest oil and gas fields in North America. It includes over 1,100 active oil producing wells and five satellite oil fields. The main reservoir is located in what's called an anticlinal structural stratigraphic trap, specifically a 500-foot thick Permian to Triassic sandstone unit, buried thousands of feet underground. Production began in 1977, and total production through 2013 was 12 billion barrels. As of 2022, the field produces about 320,000 barrels per day. An estimated 4 billion barrels of recoverable oil remain and can be recovered with current technology. Mean estimates of undiscovered technically recoverable petroleum resources in the larger Arctic Alaska Petroleum Province suggest more than 50 billion barrels of petroleum and more than 227 trillion cubic feet of natural gas remain to be discovered. Crude oil is transported via the 800-mile-long Trans-Alaska Pipeline to the nearest ice-free port, which is the Valdez Marine Terminal on Prince William Sound on Alaska's southern coast. This is where the oil is loaded onto tankers for distribution around the world. 
Arizona produces minor amounts of oil associated with the subsurface Paradox Basin. These small oil fields are located in the Four Corners region of the Colorado Plateau. Burning petroleum and natural gas provides heat for much of the U.S. Heating oil is especially important in the Northeast. These hydrocarbons are also important in powering internal combustion engines of various types and jet engines as well. And of course, there's the OG Mad Max with his supercharged V8 interceptor. Petroleum and natural gas are important sources of energy for electrical power plants, especially natural gas. Using a process similar to that of a coal-fired power plant, the burning of natural gas and oil runs a turbine that powers a generator which makes the electricity. Burning natural gas at these power plants is a relatively clean and efficient means to produce electricity and helps provide around 38% of U.S. electrical generation as of 2023. But even natural gas-produced electrical generation has become politicized of late, again due to its perceived negative effects of adding CO2 to the atmosphere and causing global warming. However, natural gas power provides over one-third of U.S. electricity, and shutting down all natural gas power plants is not a realistic option. I'm starting to sound like a broken record. Arizona has about 18 natural gas power plants that produce about 28% of its electricity. Two large electrical utilities operate gas-fired power plants across Arizona. Arizona Public Service, or APS, operates ones like the gas-fired Ocotillo plant in Tempe, just east of ASU. And the Salt River Project, or SRP, runs the 2200 megawatt Gila River power station in Gila Bend. Uranium is a radioactive element that has several different isotopes, but uranium-235 is the only isotope that is fissile, meaning that it can sustain a nuclear fission reaction. Nuclear fission involves the splitting of certain heavy isotopes, like uranium-235, into lighter elements, with the subsequent release of a tremendous amount of energy. Nuclear fission of a dime-sized pellet of uranium-235 is the energy equivalent to burning three barrels of oil, one ton of coal, or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. This is why nuclear power is typically a resource of choice for countries that have the technical means to build and maintain nuclear power plants. The uranium ore, uraninite, formerly known as pitchblend, is an oxide mineral that is mined in 13 countries around the world. In the western U.S., it is found in different geologic settings, including breccia pipes, sedimentary rocks, etc. Yellow cake is the more processed version of this ore. Uranium-235 represents less than 1% of naturally occurring uranium, and it must be separated from the more abundant uranium-238, and this process is expensive. Uranium can be considered a fossil fuel as it is present in finite supply. It is expensive to extract and derive power from, and there are significant radioactive waste disposal concerns. Nuclear power is another non-renewable energy resource. In the U.S., about 93 nuclear units supply roughly 20% of U.S. electrical demands, at least as of 2023. Other than the initial production of energy, the electrical generation process is fairly similar to that of a coal or natural gas-fired power plant. The nuclear reaction takes place and is regulated by a series of control rods. This heats a liquid, typically pressurized water, which then creates steam that runs a turbine that powers a generator which makes the electricity. Shown here is the Hope Creek Nuclear Generating Station in New Jersey. Well, building nuclear power plants is certainly complex and expensive, and due to the toxic nature of its spent nuclear fuel and control rods, Nuclear power has been widely demonized over the years. However, nuclear power provides one-fifth of U.S. electricity, and simply ending nuclear power is not a realistic option. As previously noted, it provides an immense amount of energy that cannot easily be reproduced by other means. 
Arizona is home to the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Plant, located about 45 miles west of Phoenix. Its three reactor units produce almost 4,000 megawatts of electrical power, making it the largest nuclear power plant in the United States for the last few decades. As of 2017, Palo Verde supplied about 30% of Arizona's electricity. The Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station is located near Tonopah, Arizona, about 45 miles west of downtown Phoenix. Palo Verde is the only large nuclear power plant in the world not located near a large body of water. It uses treated municipal wastewater from nearby towns and cities. Its three pressurized water reactors can each generate 1,400 megawatts of electrical power and about 32 terawatt hours annually. Here's how it works. A pressurized water reactor uses three loops of water. A closed loop, heated by the nuclear reactor, here shown in red, runs through pipes that heat water in adjacent boilers, shown in orange, producing steam, shown in yellow, which spins turbines and powers a generator which makes the electricity. This steam is condensed by cooling water, shown in blue, and returns to the boilers. After this heat exchange, this water, again shown in blue, flows back out to the cooling towers, where it is pumped to the top and cools as it falls, as droplets to the bottom. This power plant took about 12 years to build and became fully operational in 1988. The plant is operated by the Arizona Public Service Company, or APS, and is jointly owned by APS, the Salt River Project, the El Paso Electric Company, Southern California Edison, and others. Palo Verde is a major source of electrical power for the densely populated areas of Southern Arizona, Nevada, and California, which includes metro areas like Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Side note, Upon completion of Unit 4 in late 2023 or 2024, the Vogel nuclear power plant in Georgia will become the largest nuclear power plant in the U.S., passing Palo Verde. Along with the Watts Bar Unit 2 reactor in Tennessee, Vogel Units 3 and 4 are the first new nuclear reactors built in over 30 years. Now the discussion turns to renewable energy resources, and we'll begin with water. Flowing or moving water can produce power, hydropower. Humans have taken advantage of this since at least the 3rd century BCE, constructing various types of water mills along streams. One example is Colvin Run Mill in Great Falls, Virginia, which was built in 1811. More modern hydropower constructs include hydroelectric dams, usually placed along streams with very high water flow, or discharge. The 22,500 megawatt Three Gorges Dam in China is currently the largest of these. Tidal areas employ tide mills since the Middle Ages and tidal power plants more recently to take advantage of the predictable daily changes in sea level. However, these areas are typically restricted to those having sufficiently high tidal ranges and are thus somewhat limited in availability. The Three Gorges Dam is a hydroelectric dam on the Yangtze River in central China. Construction of this mega project began in 1994 and was completed in 2006. The dam reached full generating capacity in 2012. Like most gravity dams, this dam is straight and is almost 600 feet in height and 1.5 miles in length. It's the largest power plant in the world, with its 32 generators producing a total electrical generating capacity of 22,500 megawatts. Annual electrical generation between 2012 and 2021 was around 97 terawatt hours, or roughly 20 times greater than that of the Hoover Dam. Of note, the upstream flooding of over 390,000 square miles resulted in the displacement of between 1.3 and 1.9 million people from more than 1,500 cities, towns, and villages. 
Hydroelectric power produces 7% of U.S. electricity as of 2013 and is most important along the West Coast, several Western states, and the Southeast. When generated along rivers, the concept is to dam a large river that has significant flow volume and drop in elevation. Accordingly, water falls through a tunnel, or penstock, where its potential energy is used to physically spin turbines which power generators. This turbine and generator method is essentially the same whether it uses water, coal, natural gas, or nuclear power. In this case, a turbine converts the energy of the flowing water into mechanical energy, and then a hydroelectric generator converts this mechanical energy into electricity. Here, the 819 megawatt Oroville Dam is located along the Feather River in Northern California. The 2080 megawatt Hoover Dam is located along the Colorado River on the border between Arizona and Nevada. And the Grand Coulee Dam can provide about 6,800 megawatts of electricity using the Columbia River in Washington. Hydroelectric dams exist on several major river systems in the U.S., including the Columbia, Colorado, Tennessee, etc. In the southwest, a number of dams have been built on the Colorado River. Water is stored in large reservoirs behind the dams, which form extensive lakes, like Lake Powell behind the Glen Canyon Dam. Well, hydroelectric power is like any energy resource. There are pluses and minuses in its use. Large dams significantly disrupt river systems both above and below the dam, and the reservoirs will ultimately silt up from all the trapped sediment over the years. In Arizona, hydropower produces 6.5% of its electricity as of 2017. After 11 years of construction, the 1300 megawatt Glen Canyon Dam came online in 1966. It's located on the Colorado River in Arizona, just south of the Utah border. This is the Glen Canyon Dam during a major release in 1983. Eight generators in yellow are connected to turbines below and are housed in the long power plant building at the base of the dam. The Glen Canyon Dam is a hydroelectric dam on the Colorado River in northern Arizona. It forms Lake Powell with its almost 2,000 miles of shoreline located mostly in Utah. After 10 years of construction, the dam became operational in 1966. Glen Canyon is a large network of canyons carved into the Mesozoic sedimentary rocks of southern Utah and was flooded as the Lake Powell Reservoir was filled. The dam is curved so as to direct most of the water pressure against the canyon rock walls, composed of the Jurassic Navajo sandstone. The dam was built to capture and store water of the Colorado River for use by the seven states in the upper and lower Colorado River basins. The dam's secondary function of hydroelectric generation has provided an average of 4.7 terawatt hours annually between 1980 and 2013 to millions of people across the Southwest. Its eight generators have a capacity of 1,320 megawatts, a similar output to just one of the Palo Verde nuclear power plant's three reactors. Since first filling to capacity in 1980, Lake Powell water levels have fluctuated greatly depending on water demand and annual runoff. As of September 2023, Lake Powell was 36% full. The next dam downstream of the Glen Canyon Dam is the Hoover Dam. This 2080 megawatt dam was built between 1931 and 1936 during the Great Depression and began operation in 1936. The bridge downstream was added later in 2010. The 120 watt Parker Dam is one of several smaller dams located on the Colorado River below the Hoover Dam, and it forms Lake Havasu. Like the Glen Canyon Dam, Hoover Dam is another large hydroelectric dam on the Colorado River, located on the Arizona-Nevada border near Las Vegas. This dam forms Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the U.S., with its hundreds of miles of irregular shoreline. 
a narrow portion of Black Canyon was chosen as the dam site. It includes mostly tilted and faulted Miocene volcanic and intrusive rocks, as well as conglomerate. Built for water storage and allocation, flood control, and hydroelectric power, the dam was completed in 1936. 96 workers died while building the dam from drowning, blasting, falling rocks, falling from canyon walls, etc. At 890 feet above the Colorado River, the Hoover Dam Bypass Bridge was completed in 2010. This curved gravity arch dam is 726 feet high. It is 660 feet wide at its base, but only 45 feet wide at its crest. From the four intake towers, water descends about 500 feet through huge pipes called penstocks, ultimately driving a series of hydraulic turbines and their electric generators. Hoover Dam's 17 generators have a capacity of 2,080 megawatts and on average generates about 4.2 terawatt hours per year for customers in Arizona, Nevada, and Southern California. Lake Mead has remained below full capacity since 1983 owing to drought and increased water demand. As of September 2023, Lake Mead was 34% full. Geothermal power is usually restricted to active geothermal areas. It is most widespread in the western U.S., especially in California and Nevada. There are different ways to generate power from geothermal energy, but the basic methodology is to pump water to depth, where it heats up and then the water or steam is retrieved. You know what happens next. The steam drives a turbine, which powers a generator that makes the electricity. The Geyser's 1,517 megawatt geothermal plant in California is the largest of its kind in the world. In Arizona, areas with geothermal potential are mostly located in the Basin and Range in the southern part of the state. Solar power uses sunlight to create electricity, and as of 2023, solar power produced around 5% of U.S. electricity. There are two basic ways in which this is accomplished. The photovoltaic or PV method uses special PV cells to directly create electricity. This is a relatively clean process that works well on small scales. However, it can be scaled upward in size, like the 550 megawatt Topaz solar farm in California. Large-scale PV solar power is still relatively expensive, inefficient, and of course climate dependent. Concentrated solar power is fundamentally different than PV in how it generates electricity. In one design, thousands of heliostats, or mirrors, focus the sunlight on a central tower, where it heats molten salt, which creates steam, which, you guessed it, drives a turbine that powers the generator. The 392-megawatt Ivanpah Concentrated Solar Thermal Plant in Southern California employs over 170,000 heliostats, focusing sunlight to three central towers. It should be noted that these large arrays have had a negative effect on local wildlife, mainly birds that unfortunately fly through the array. Another design uses long parabolic mirrors to focus the sunlight on tubes filled with molten salt, which then generates steam to run a turbine that powers a generator. The Ivanpah Solar Electric Generating Facility is a 3,500-acre concentrated solar plant in the Mojave Desert. The project received a $1.6 billion federal loan guarantee and is built on public land. It consists of three solar thermal power plants that together have a gross capacity of 392 megawatts. And in 2020, the facility's annual electricity output was about 856 gigawatt hours. The arrays are composed of roughly 173,500 heliostats, which are simply planar mirrors that follow the sun and reflect its light toward a predetermined target. Each field of heliostats focuses solar energy on a boiler positioned atop a 460-foot tower, which then powers a steam turbine. 
It should be noted that significant amounts of natural gas are used to commence daily operations. A negative environmental impact includes the estimated 3,500 bird and bat deaths per year, burned from flying through the intense reflected light. And many desert tortoises found on the site had to be relocated to other parts of the Mojave Desert. In Arizona, there are several large solar projects that are either existing or proposed. PV accounts for roughly 1,100 megawatts and includes the 290 megawatt Agua Caliente PV array near Yuma. Concentrated solar power accounts for about 300 megawatts, with much of it coming from the 280 megawatt Solana generating station near Hila Bend. Finally, Wind power has been used for centuries to drive mills and pumps. Technology has evolved windmill design, and wind turbines are now also used to convert wind energy to mechanical energy to create electricity. Wind power now supplies about 11% of U.S. electricity as of 2023. And this clean source of power is, of course, location-dependent, with the Midwest having a large number of wind farms. If you have traveled across the country recently, I'm sure you've noticed the increased number of wind turbines across the landscape. Again, each energy resource always has positive and negative aspects. Wind power cannot produce electricity at a constant rate, as it is dependent on environmental conditions. Another factor is the lifetime and disposal of the large turbine blades. Some can last up to 20 years, but many are replaced in less than 10 years. And their lightweight, weather-resistant compositions typically make them unfit for recycling and they end up in landfills. The Tehachapi Wind Resource Area is located in Southern California, where Tehachapi Pass creates a venturi effect on air moving between the ocean and inland desert, increasing its velocity. Several wind farms are located in this area, with the 3,200-acre Alta Wind Energy Center, or AWEC, being the largest in the U.S. as of 2022, and third largest onshore wind energy project in the world. The Altec Wind Energy Center includes up to 600 operational wind turbines of various types, which deliver an average of 3.2 terawatt hours annually. The large V90-3000 wind turbines are up to 105 meters in height and weigh up to 400 tons. The blades are made of reinforced epoxy and carbon fibers, with each being 44 meters in length and weighing 33 to 35 tons. These turbines are designed to operate between wind speeds of 9 and 56 miles per hour, and the blade tips can reach velocities of up to 195 miles per hour. Turbine blades can typically last about 20 years, but require maintenance every few years due to the damaging effects of ice and dust. Well, that's all for now. Till next time. <laughs>